Hello boys and girls, welcome once again to John Robson Guitar Tuition, how are you? Uh, the other day, one of my students asked me quite a simple question. Who invented the electric guitar? And I've got to tell you, to my shame, I was kind of stuck for an answer. Because, I mean, yes, we all know that Leo Fender played a big part in the evolution of the electric guitar, and so did Les Paul, but there were electric guitars around before either of those guys. So I did a little bit of research on the history of the electric guitar and I thought I'd share it with you. Here it is. The guitar began its rise to popularity in the latter part of the 19th century. Unlike a piano, it was easily transportable, which was important for people on the move, like the American settlers moving west. Unlike a violin, which was transportable, it was much better at providing an accompaniment for singing. And unlike a banjo, it actually sounded nice. It did, however, have one major drawback. Guitars like this that were the kind available in the late 1800s lacked one important thing, volume. In 1916, the Martin Guitar Company decided to address this issue when they released their Dreadnought style guitar. Named after a class of battleship, it had a bigger sound box and a squarer body shape, which went some way to producing the desired increase in decibels. Now, round about the same time, a steel guitarist by the name of George Beecham began collaborating with an instrument maker called John Dupiera and they produced the National Resonator guitar which went on sale in the 1920s. National guitars and the later Dobros, also made by Dupiera, relied on a system of mechanical amplification with a spun aluminium speaker cone being driven by the vibration of the strings. Both of these solutions worked to an extent, but guitarists were still at the disadvantage when they had to fill a large venue with sound or compete with other louder instruments, so something else needed to happen. And it's at this point in the tale that we meet up again with George Beecham. He was still looking for more volume for his steel guitar, so he approached instrument maker Adolf Rickenbacker to produce an electrically amplified guitar. Who'd have thought of such a thing? Together, Rickenbacker and Beecham developed this instrument, the frying pan, as it's affectionately known. Now this was, really speaking, a lap steel guitar meant to be played flat across your knees, not held in the way that we tend to imagine guitars being played these days, but nevertheless it was the world's first electrically amplified guitar using an electromagnetic pickup. The cat, as they say, was out of the bag. And it wasn't long before the Gibson Guitar Company took one of these newfangled electromagnetic pickups and bolted it to one of their existing archtop jazz guitars, creating the ES-150. Incidentally, the term ES, which features in so many Gibson model numbers, actually stands for Electric Spanish, because to hold a guitar flat against your torso, in what we now think of as how you hold a guitar, back then was thought of as the Spanish way of playing the guitar, as opposed to playing a steel guitar flat across your knees. The Gibson ES-150 was a huge hit, largely due to the impact of a brilliant young guitarist by the name of Charlie Christian, who pretty much single-handedly invented the concept of the electric lead guitarist via his work with one of the biggest stars of the swing jazz era, none other than Benny Goodman. So now guitarists had all the volume that they needed, but that in itself led to another problem, feedback. The loud amplified guitar sound would come out of the speakers and hit the strings of the guitar causing them to vibrate which would get picked up by the pickup which would come out of the speakers and you see what's going to happen here, that horrible howling feedback that I'm sure we've all heard at a gig at some point in the past. So what was the solution? Well if you could somehow stop the hollow body of the guitar resonating with the sound that was coming out of the speakers that would go a long way to curing this problem. 
And it's at this point in the story that we meet up with one of the true geniuses of the electric guitar, Mr. Lester William Polfus, better known to you and I as Les Paul. In 1940, Les Paul took the neck from an Epiphone jazz guitar and bolted it onto a solid lump of pine as a body. He then fitted pickups and strings and all the usual accoutrements and created the world's first solid-bodied Spanish electric guitar. This solved his feedback problems instantly. It was so successful that he took the concept to guitar makers Gibson, who it's fair to say were less than receptive to this radical idea of a guitar that couldn't be heard unless it was actually plugged in. It would take the intervention of a small town radio repairman who didn't even play the guitar to drive this concept of the solid bodied electric guitar to the next level. Leo Fender, for it is he, owned a small electrical shop in California and many of his customers were the electric guitarists in local bands who were also struggling with this issue of feedback at high volume. And he decided, because he was an inveterate tinkerer, to have a go at making a guitar that would be resistant to this problem. Because Leo Fender was just tinkering around trying to solve the problems of local musicians, records are sketchy about when the first Fender electric guitar was actually made, but we can safely say that it was sometime in the late 40s or early 1950s when Leo Fender produced the guitar that would become the iconic Telecaster. Originally dubbed the Broadcaster, but changed to Telecaster following a legal dispute with another owner of that name, the Fender Telecaster has remained in production constantly ever since. There are some that say, and you'll not find me disagreeing with them, that the Fender Telecaster is pretty much the perfect electric guitar. It proved such a hit at the time that Gibson began to reconsider their rather derisory response to Les Paul's concept of a solid-bodied electric guitar. They got in touch with him and pretty soon afterwards the Gibson Les Paul was born. The solid-bodied electric guitar was now part of the mainstream. Leo Fender, meanwhile, was taking suggestions from his guitarist customers about how he could improve and refine his electric guitar design, the Telecaster. Suggestions included a tremolo arm, comfort contours on the body, more pickups, and in 1954 all of this coalesced together to produce one of the most recognisable guitar shapes in history, the Fender Stratocaster. I think it's remarkable that two of the world's best electric guitar designs, the Telecaster and the Stratocaster, were perfected by a guy who didn't play a note of music on the instrument. Isn't that incredible? Now Fender's futuristic looking designs, all full of tail fin flash and jet age sophistication, were beginning to make the Gibson Les Paul seem quite dated by comparison. And it's at this point in the story that we meet up with yet another great innovator of the electric guitar, Ted McCarty. McCarty was the president of the Gibson Guitar Company at the time and his response to Fender's growing popularity was to try and come up with some futuristic looking designs of his own. This resulted in the Explorer, the Modern, the Flying V and the Firebird which despite becoming massively successful in subsequent years, with the exception of the modern, all of these guitars at the time were a resounding flop. There was however one massively successful guitar which came out of this rethink, the ES-335. This was as much of an evolutionary guitar as it was a revolutionary guitar. It featured the newly developed humbucking pickups, we'll come back to those shortly, that will buy now also on the Les Paul. But its main distinguishing feature was the fact that it was neither a hollow body guitar nor a solid body guitar, it was a bit of both. It was essentially a hollow guitar with a solid centre block. This solid mass that the pickups and bridge were mounted into gave enough resistance to feedback 
to prevent problems at high volume, but still maintained a lot of the resonance and natural acoustic sustain of a hollow-bodied guitar. Now, I've already mentioned the humbucking pickups that Gibson were fitting to their guitars by this time, so what's the story with those? Well, another problem, as well as feedback, that electric guitarists had to deal with in the early days was that of mains hum. Basically, an electric guitar pickup is simply a magnet and a coil of wire. And for complicated electrical reasons that I won't go into just now, as well as picking up the sound of the strings, a guitar pickup is very good at picking up any form of electrical noise around it, like mains hum. It took a Gibson employee by the name of Seth Lover to develop a new design of pickup using two coils of wire to eradicate this problem. A byproduct of this was that this new humbucking pickup, because it gets rid of the hum, remember, was also a much beefier sounding pickup with more sustain. This coupled with the natural acoustic sustain of the ES335's semi-hollow body design made it a brilliant choice of guitar for the burgeoning electric blues and rock boom of the 1960s. By now we had the Stratocaster, the Telecaster, the Les Paul and the Gibson ES335. These guitars dominated the sound of popular music pretty much until the end of the 1970s when yet another great innovator of the electric guitar was to burst forth onto the scene. Eddie Van Halen and his band Van Halen combined instantly catchy radio friendly pop rock tunes with heavy riffing and virtuoso guitar soloing of the type that had never been heard before. A player as revolutionary as this needed a guitar that was just as revolutionary the problem was, no such guitar was readily available, so he went about creating his own. Basically a hot rodded Fender Stratocaster design, but with high output Gibson humbucking pickups and the newly developed Floyd Rose tremolo system which prevented the tuning problems associated with heavy tremolo use on an old school Fender style tremolo amp. This kind of guitar which became known as the Super Strat pretty much dominated the whole of the 1980s rock and metal scene. And although Eddie Van Halen, who was arguably the originator of this hot rodded Fender Strat design, never actually played an Ibanez guitar, Ibanez were the company that became predominantly associated with this breed of instrument. Not least because of their association with a certain Mr. Steve Vai. And you could say that that pretty much brings the story of the electric guitar up to date. Truth be told, there haven't been that many big innovations since the late 1980s. I mean, sure, there's the seven-string guitar, something else we've got Steve Vai to thank for, but that hasn't had much of an impact outside the world of heavy metal. Also, we've had various attempts at combining the guitar with MIDI technology, guitars that can be hooked up to your laptop to do all sorts of clever things. But these have yet to make much of an impact, and frankly, we've seen all this kind of thing before. Anyone remember the Synthax from the late 1980s? Didn't catch on, did it? In truth, I think that much like the drummers who soon tired of the drum synthesizer thing that came out in the late 70s, us guitarists will usually revert to type and go back to playing plain old strats, Telecasters, Les Pauls and 335s and possibly the odd super strap from time to time. The only innovation, if you can call it that, since the 1990s has been the concept of relicking a guitar, basically making a brand new guitar look like it's been buried in a peat bog for 35 years. Yeah, the debate still rages about whether that's a good thing or bad, but it's down to personal taste I guess. It does indicate, however, that perhaps the guitar industry is now looking backwards more than it's looking forwards. Or maybe it's a sign that Ted McCarty and Leo Fender and Les Paul and all the rest of the innovators that we've talked about basically got it right to begin with. Only time will tell. 
And there you have it. That is my personal take on the history of the electric guitar. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you're a guitarist who lives on Teesside, then I am available for tuition. One-to-one -one tailored lessons in any style you like, and your first lesson is free. So get in touch via the details at the end of this video. And if you've enjoyed the piece of music that's been bubbling away in the background whilst I've been talking, you might want to know that it's a track called The Home Stretch which is taken from my brand new album entitled The Whiskey Made Me Do It, which is available on Amazon, iTunes, Spotify, all the usual places. So grab yourself a copy, you know it makes sense. Right, that's it for today folks, I hope you've enjoyed it and I'll see you all next time. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.